evening include Ambassador Alberto Fernandez, veteran U.S. diplomat, vice president of the Middle East Media Research Institute, and member of the IDC Board of Advisors. Aram Hamparian, executive director of the Armenian National Committee of America. Commissioner Nadine Manza, commissioner at the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Robert Nicholson, president and executive director of the Philos Project and member of the IDC Board of Advisors. And finally, Samuel Tadros, a uh, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute's Center for Religious Freedom. Welcome to you all. We'll start with you, Aram. Uh, in 2019, as of course you know, we celebrated the passage of the Armenian Genocide Resolution in both chambers of Congress, House and Senate. Uh, Aram, if, if signed by the White House, what are some ways that genocide recognition uh, stand to benefit the Christian communities of the Middle East? Sure, it's, a, it's an excellent question, Rich. And uh, let me start by saying a major thank you to In Defense of Christians for partnering with us on the resolutions that passed overwhelmingly, nearly, nearly unanimously in the Senate and House. Um, uh, IDC is just really what America needed. It's in many ways uh, America's answer to a century of indifference to the plight of Christians and other at-risk religious minorities around the world. It is very much a voice for the voiceless globally, but also a voice for the unheard here in America. So we're just deeply grateful for, uh, for all that IDC did to pass those resolutions so overwhelmingly. Um, what we did together was to end the longest lasting, the largest foreign gag rule in American history. That was really uh, epic. It was a very, very important uh, resolution and one that has implications for exactly what you talked about. What we said is we sent a message to the world that America is not going to outsource our genocide policy, our human rights policy to dictators around the world, that we are not going to be bullied or bribed into silence. And that's really important. When uh, a potential future perpetrator of genocide starts thinking about perhaps repeating what happened in 1915 or repeating what happened, um, uh, what ISIS perpetrated, uh, when they start thinking about that, they're going to say, okay, do you think that we can kind of like manage the Americans into silence on this issue? Or will we have to deal with the American people on this front? And I think that the passage of the resolution sent that message um, to perpetrators uh, around the world that America will stand up for the victims of genocide, uh, regardless of the political consequences. So I think as a result, uh, certainly as Armenians, we feel safer. The resolution talks about Assyrians and Chaldeans and Greeks, of course, uh, Maronites, Arameans, uh, and, uh, and and Syriacs. So it's, it encompasses the sort of the full range of the, of the Turkish uh, genocide. But I think our nations can certainly feel a little more secure that our, our suffering is not forgotten. But I think other groups around the world can feel better, perhaps safer, uh, that America cannot be bullied or bribed into silence. Thank you. And staying on the topic of Turkey, we just heard from Congressman Bilirakis about his work on House Resolution 1050, which addresses Turkey's oppression of Christians within its borders. In a national interest uh, opinion piece last week, IDC President Tufik Baklini and Michael Rubin of the American Enterprise Institute pointed out that Turkey is also actively engaged in oppressing and even attacking Christians beyond its borders. Uh, now, Commissioner Manza, can you tell us a bit about Turkey's current campaign uh, targeting the Syriac Christians in Northeast Syria? Sure. So in Northeast Syria, you know, um, Yusuf for quite a few years um, has, has been talking about the autonomous administration of North and East Syria. This government that is, is one of the only places in the Middle East where you can proselytize, legally change your religion. It's really been a refuge for religious minorities. I visited in last November and saw for myself how Christians like Syriacs, Assyrian, Armenians, Chaldeans, and even Kurdish Christian converts um, are able to live along with Muslims in a really tolerant society and be a part of governing. And so Turkey has spent millions of dollars trying to um, sell this narrative that this government exists solely to defeat Turkey, which is ridiculous. They exist to govern. And so last October, Turkey invaded Northeast Syria for the third time with its Islamist allies, forcing over 200,000 to flee. The Christians, Yazidis, Kurds, and others who stayed have been subjected to killings, rapes, kidnapping, forced conversions, extortion, destruction of religious sites and cemeteries. And so we had a, um, you sort of held a hearing on this in June, and we talked about both the remarkable religious freedom conditions in the autonomous administration, as well as what's happening in the areas Turkey invaded. And um, these crimes are, are really horrible. Um, the UN just released a report last week um, documenting these and calling on Turkey to intervene and to stop. And then Genocide Watch has called these crimes against humanity. So the, the international community can no longer look, look away. So it's really, you know, being tough on Turkey, but it's also supporting this government that, that um, is, is doing this remarkable job of standing up for women's rights, human rights, and of course, religious freedom. So it gives us a real opportunity. And I, and I think IDC, I, you guys have convened a lot of 
private meetings with people connected us and always been this place in Washington where we can go um, and learn more information and connect with others. And I think most people don't see all the work IDC does behind the scenes. That is really crucial to all of us who advocate for religious freedom. And an interesting thing, uh, Commissioner Manza, uh, for some historical context, most of the Syriac Christian, Assyrian Christian victims in Northeast Syria are also the descendants of survivors yes. of the Syriac Assyrian, uh, Armenian genocide that Aram just spoke about uh, a moment ago. So not, not only are they descendants of these survivors, they themselves are also survivors of the ISIS genocide. Right. They're descendants so of two genocides in as many generations. Right. And here we have Turkey coming right back in and doing the same exact same thing. And yet people are giving them a pass because they're saying they're a NATO ally. And what we're saying at USURF is NATO, being a NATO ally should actually not give them a pass, but instead they should be held to even a higher standard. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, that answer. Um, next, I want to uh, shift over to uh, Samuel Tadros. Um, we just heard from Congressman French Hill. As you know, IDC has been a strong advocate uh, in favor of House Resolution 49 which among other things, urges the government of Egypt to enact serious reforms to ensure Coptic Christians are treated equally uh, under Egyptian law. Mr. Tedros, in your view, what are some of the, the specific initiatives or reforms that the, that the Egyptian government should, uh, uh, should prioritize today? You highlighted the key word, equality. What we are asking for in Egypt is basic equality. We're not asking for a privileged position for Christians, not for them to be a special status, but for them to receive the basic rights of every Egyptian citizen and for the rule of law to be implemented on all of Egypt's citizens. The government's practice of refusing to deal with sectarian attacks by re resorting to the reconciliation sessions instead of going to court has resulted in a culture of impunity and a culture of encouragement for those attacks. Through over a thousand attacks since the 1970s until today by the mob, no, not a single person has been punished for those attacks. The government is all too happy to punish Muslim Brotherhood or other Islamists when they engage in violence, but when it comes to mob attacks on Christians, they do not act at all. Uh, and, and Sam, when when the uh, the Egyptian government operates in such a way, do they do so under uh, you know a different pretense, or do they do they do they use it? Do they use some other uh, excuse to explain their their lack of equal treatment under the law? I think they they claim a number of things. They claim that these are societal solutions to societal problems. That it's better to deal with these issues on the local level. And that by doing so, they make sure that the issue is, does not continue and more attacks don't take place. Now, all of these excuses, of course, are untrue, meaning that attacks continue, as I mentioned, all these number of attacks, hundreds, one over a thousand attacks since the 1970s. If you repeat the same process and at this point you get the same result, well, maybe you should try a different solution for change. Thank you. We actually have a question that just came in from Maryam Wahba from, uh, she's here in DC. Uh, the question is for you also, uh, Mr. Tedros. Taken into account the very recent protests in Egypt against President Sisi, what is the Coptic stance uh, and, and who owes, to whom do we owe our Coptic loyalty? Well, I think the, the, each person chooses his political views. I don't think there's a collective Coptic response or collective Coptic position on political developments in Egypt. I think the Copts occupy different positions on the spectrum between those who support the current government and those that oppose it. And I think that's healthy. I think it's, uh, it's the natural position. Of course, the size of the protests were extremely minor and were Muslim Brotherhood organized protests mostly. And, and of course, as long as the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists continue to dominate the opposition to President Sisi, no one should be surprised that cops wouldn't get excited about joining such protests. Thank you. Um, thank you all to all of our panelists. Um, this is not over. We, we will be back later on in the program, but I encourage our viewers to keep those questions coming in. Uh, we will get to each and every one of them. We will try our best to anyhow, um, but uh, we will see you back here in just a moment. Uh, back to you, Tracy.